moved. It moved when I was. Um, it's recording to... now, Susan. Yeah. Okay. Now, now I'll go back to screen share because it wasn't screen sharing and giving me the mouse. Okay. Now here we are. Right. Can I start? <laughs> okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Gerbeck, and I will be giving you my contact information at the very end of this presentation. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak to your group today. We're going to be talking in more of an abstract way about collecting, respecting, and sharing and preserving your family history. This is about your family history. And I want to say before I start that I am a person who is not an expert on photography per se, but I have collected photographs all my life. And this is my teenage bedroom that <laughs> from high school, as you can see, I've always had an affinity for photographs. I've always wanted them around me. I uh, totally enjoy photos and having them near me and having them visual. So I have a lot of respect for photography. I'm also a social historian by um, degree and I, I have a deep respect for collecting and preserving people's um, history. So this is me back in the 1980s. I am a portrait photographer by trade. I was um, working in a department store at JCPenney's for 34 years. And this is me playing peekaboo with one of, the, one of the customers that I had there over the years. That little girl, I was thinking about it the other day, she's probably 35 or 36 now. She may be a grandmother herself. That's how long we're talking about for me. And so, you know, I've always had this, this desire to be around photographs and to have them um, near me. And um, as you can see from my photograph that I'm about to share here, this is my, my office that you're looking at right now. And this kind of look of having photographs around me is still around and I have not um, uh, changed much, but I just love, adore having memories around. And that is the view I have out of my um, computer screen right now, if you were looking. Pill time, pill time. <laughs> no, that's not me. Oh, okay. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk about uh, organization of photography and as well as keeping your and starting projects and um, beginning, beginning this because I've heard over for hundreds of people I've talked to over the years what a, what a nightmare it is, you know, trying to, to grasp where you're going to be starting with these projects. And I think the first thing you've got to do is you've got to stop and say, what is my goal? So before you even learn how to use software before you go out and purchase a scanner before you um, get start start looking at scrapbooking videos or how to uh, to uh, uh, do the task i think you need to stop and really think about what your goal is because we know our limitations in each of us and we should know you know am i the personality type that needs to put everything on spreadsheets or, and, and get the data and you know, get into the minutia of it? Or am I the type of person who likes to start projects and never seems to finish them? Are you the type of person that is um, interested in um, you know, the, the history of it? Or are you more of a facts kind of, um, you know, you'll spend hours working on one topic or one subject or one photograph. And so only you know what your goal should be. Uh, you, only you are going to be the one that's going to be able to, to make this decision of how to, what is it I want to do with, with what I'm learning. For example, we can, we can think about creating scrapbooks and scrapbooks can be done with a pencil, I mean a pencil, scissors and glue sticks and stickers and putting them in albums. It could be that scrapbooking kind of thing that was really popular about 10 years ago. Or it could be digital photographs, um, digital photographs put into digital albums that are just shared on a computer. Or you can also go through and create these and have them printed. And again, you would need vid digital images and you could, there's software programs, there's all kinds of different ways of putting uh, books together. And then again, once you've decided you want to do something like that, well, then what is your theme? Are you creating this because um, you're creating it for somebody who's just now graduating from college and you want to do maybe their their first 18 years of life and to go back and, and use all the images that you've collected or can find? 
or maybe it's something for somebody's retirement. Maybe, and you want to put together an album for retirement, or maybe it is the child's first year and you just have a, a, an awful lot of photographs of the child's first year. And then when you're thinking about it that way, you're, you're trying to come up with some idea of what is my final product going to be? Is it going to be a printed album? Is it going to be an album I've made on my own and, and you know, as, with stickers and, and pictures, the actual photograph? Is it, um, like I said, just a digital, something that's going to be shared digitally? The other thing to think about is, do you want it to be, do you want a journal? Do you want stories in it? Or do you want it to be just photographs? Do you want to combine photographs from other people? Like maybe if you're creating this album for a grandchild, maybe you could take a photograph of yourself at one year, a photograph of the the mother or father of the child and then a, at one year and then a photograph of the child, the, your grandchild at one year and put them together on one, you know, one page trying to make all the pictures look the same, you know, all black and white, you know, kind of the same. That would be an interesting look, but photographs in a book are, you know, it's a task obviously, and that can be a big task. So I want you to think about that before you get started. Same thing with old photographs. Do you have old photographs that are in a, uh, a an old album? Is, is your goal to put them in an album or is your goal to take them out of albums and do a, something else with them? You know, kind of sca either scan them or provide some context to what people are looking at. So um, to make copies of these things so that they last, so they're not just in an album somewhere. So is that your goal? Possibly your goal would be to create an album of a vacation or um, you went to Europe and you, you met up with family there and you want to create an album just for, for that trip, a cruise you went on. So I was, no. I was wanting to get a gift membership, but I wanted to check. <laughs> get your tambourine on a computer. Um, is yeah, that your goal to do a family adventure of some sort? Is, it, is that your album? Or, and this is a case of a lot of people, have you just located a box of photographs or a drawer of photographs that's in the back of a, a, a closet somewhere? Or maybe this is something you collected or you inherited. Maybe it's a cousin who um, has passed on and you just inherited this box. You don't know whose pictures are in here. You don't know if you should throw them away. You don't know who... Who these people are should you give it to somebody and what if people don't want it is it is it applicable to your family history and what do we do you feel this great responsibility of inheriting these or finding these photographs do you do you just keep passing it on to family members and the you know your 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 children and grandchildren or cousins who may have no connection whatsoever to these family and people who would know who the pictures were of or what the dates were, or what the um, occasion was for the photograph, those people, you know, they may not be around anymore that we can ask them. So that's where, where I really want you to think about what your goal is. And then I would like you to set a date, you know, even if it's not a firm date, you know, by the end of the year, by the time of somebody's birthday, by the time they graduate, I would like to have it done and this much done. I would like to be at least this part of it finished by the time I get to the end of the year. And you and it should be a fun task. So you it's a good idea if you if you ask other people to either help you with the project or to as you go along, um, you can have told them, you can say, you know, check with me in August because I really want to have started the journaling part of this, or I want to at least be done with this box by August and hey, you know, check on me, write it on your calendar. So give yourself some kind of goal, because if you can't um, make it through some sort of milestones in the project you've set out, then maybe the project you've decided you want to do isn't the, a goal you should be doing, because you don't want to burn out on this. You want to make it some kind of task that you can actually get through so so um if you if you exceed expectations wonderful then that's fantastic but don't set the goal so high that you end up finding that you can't do it so make it realistic 
and give yourself some expectations that are actually something you can you can you can do. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about something a little bit uh, more of a task that I did. This is my mom and myself, and my mom um, in this picture is this is 2000. So um, this is at my house, and with my mom, she had collected everything, and so she had letters. She had receipts, she had recipes, clippings from newspapers, every piece of paper my mom and my father kept. But they didn't keep it in orderly ways, like in boxes or anything like that. No, no, nothing like that. She had things all over this large house that we had, and she they were shoved in corners and in envelopes and in drawers. Um, like if you went into the kitchen and you looked at the good dishes that we used whenever we were having a family, you know, a bigger deal, you might find uh, an envelope full of <laughs> cards from some holiday that we had celebrated that people had sent cards for. She would take them and put all the cards in an envelope and stick them in a cupboard with the dishes. And <laughs> you could find in there, you could find photographs within the cards, you could find money within the cards, you could find uh, mementos, um, obituaries that somebody had sent my mom. There was no end of what you might find in those pieces of envelopes all over the house. And she, and it was wonderful that she collected everything. But then again, you know, I had to downsize my mom's uh, life at some point because, you know, she was getting, um, she, this, she's in her late seventies here or, or maybe 80. And I think she's in her late seventies here. And I could see that I, as the child of the house of the generation, that I was going to be the one responsible for emptying this house and, and downsizing her. And it was a struggle because she obviously didn't want to do it. It's a big, huge task. And I didn't want to throw things away. I wanted to respect all these things that she collected, but I thought it was a good idea that we should maybe make some kind of albums. But first, let's make some order to it and see where we can go with this. And I wanted her to be able to look at these things and remember them and, and feel like, you know, that her, see her life so she could do that. So what we did is I told her, you know, she was living in a big house by herself, three bedroom house with extra rooms. I took a couch and I said, all right, this couch right here, mom, I don't want you to touch, um, clean it off. But every time you find an item in the house, a piece of paper like this, or a photograph, or a letter, a card, a postcard, take it and set it on the couch. And that's all I want you to do. And so we did this for months. And we'd go through her drawers, and we'd clean them out and look for things. And we'd find an item, we'd put it on the couch. And then, so it was a very low task task, you know. So what I did is I, I collected everything and eventually I brought it all over to my house. And this is my mom sitting at my table in my dining room. And we've already collected everything at this point. And, and now what we're going to do is we're going to try to make some sense of it. We're going to make some order of it. And what we did is we were able to, um, uh, I decided we were going to use binders. Remember, this is back in 2000. So we weren't scanning anything. This was just going to be a binder scrapbook project that we did. And I took on all the responsibility of doing it, but including my mom in as much as I possibly could. So she felt very involved and uh, she was. And I want to tell you too, that this was a huge deal. I, my mom and I had always bet, but it had, I was the youngest child. And at this point, I got to see my mother in a perspective I've never seen her before. I saw her as a young woman growing up in Arkansas, uh, very poor, and how with this huge family and how she was able to, I saw her growing up and, you know, really confused about her life and what was she going to do and how is she going to be educated and how is she going to pay for things and, you know, her life and it was it was a bonding experience that i've never thought it would happen and i and i it was priceless to be able to put these albums together for her but it actually was for me as well and for the rest of the family so you can see you really need to have a huge table when you start this project and it needs to be a table that is not going to be disturbed no food on it or anything like that so it needs to be some area that you can set aside where you can say um i'm going to try you know as I say, set a date, like within a month, by the end of the summer, 
by the end of May or whatever, set aside some time and say, we're not cleaning this up. We're going to work on this task and we're going to try to do it every Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, whatever day. And if you can involve other family members, that's a really great idea. So what, what I was able to do is it took, it took a lot of time, but I was able to create four photo albums for my mom and they were gigantic. They were very thick and I was able to put them in, you know, uh, I had four albums. One was before she had children. The next one was once she had children. And then when she got grandchildren and then, you know, after grandchildren, what I learned is, is that the albums became too heavy for my mom. She couldn't really use them, but because I was using binders, you know, I was using a binder where uh, we could take the pages in and out and move them around because I was doing this in this non printable way that I could, what I, I got smaller binders and I put the items in, I split them in half because my mom became more frail over time and she couldn't hold those binders. They were just too heavy for her to lift. So because of the way I did it, I think that it worked out well for her. And you can see, this is not professionally done. I, most of the photographs that are used in here are duplicates. And I did not alter the photographs. I didn't uh, enhance the photographs. I didn't really know how to do that at the time that I was doing this, but we left them as in intact as possible. And when my mom would tell me a story about the photograph and it could be anything, you know, just some simple memory she had about it, where it was taken, generally when it was taken, who's in the photograph. And we could, some of the photographs had writing on the back then I was able to journal that. And you can see I put some hokey, fun scrapbook stickers that I had in there. And we just put them in these folders. Now, what we can do with that is, is as my mom was remembering things, um, even after the album was created, and we'd go back and look at this, I would be able to say, she would say, oh, I remember where that was taken. And I know who that person is now. And I know what, why we were taking the photo. I could write it on a piece of paper and then I could slip it into this binder because there's just those binder sheets. And later on, I could go and print it out on my computer and then maybe redo the page. So this is kind of how I was able to do it. And my mom spent a lot of time with these photo albums and so did I. And so it was a wonderful reminder for her, especially as she got in her um, later years where her life is becoming more and more restricted because of just her health that she could pull out these binders and she could look through them and remember and see the people. Um, her memory was pretty good even till the end, but you know, we don't know that that's what's gonna happen. And when, when you're, when you're um, getting older, you don't know if you might start having memory problems, but if so, I was creating these so that she would be able to look at them and be able to um, spend time with them. So after my mother died in 2008, one of the things I did is I started learning how to scan and how to preserve them because it was this huge scare that something would happen to the photo albums. And so I wanted to be able to make these photo albums in a way so that other people in the family could share them and understand and, and enjoy them as well. So I was able to take those papers just right out of the, the plastic sheets and one at a time scan them. So what you're looking at here are two different pieces of paper that I scanned. And I was able to do that with the all of the albums and it didn't take long and it has stories on there. And again, it was able to preserve the kind of hokey way I was doing it with the stickers that I had left over and scrapbook paper and so on, as well as the journals that I put in there. And I think that I preserved it in a way that it was kind of in a, a fun way. So now remember, I have these photos already because most of these photos are duplicates. I have them already preserved in a, in a box somewhere, but this is just kind of the fun way of uh, putting them together so they're reusable. So now I'm going to talk about um, how more or less I did this. And again, remember, I'm not a professional. This is just how I did it. I sort photographs using Ziploc bags. And I'll show you some pictures in a few minutes. I find it, if not Ziploc, but whatever brand, doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be Ziploc, but they're really convenient because you can get them in different sizes, you know, gallon size, sandwich size, and they have the little zipper at the top and you can write across the plastic. Also, when you're collecting the photographs together, if you think of something, like you, you discover the date 
when those pictures were taken or you remember the story of why the pictures were taken, you can write it on a piece of paper and you can stick it in the envelope, the plastic uh, with, the, with them. So here is Mark, my boyfriend and I, uh, at the end of the year, we waited for a nice rainy day and he had tons of photographs. He had photographs in photo albums that were deteriorating. I mean, the actual albums were pretty much in bad shape. They were at, uh, they were bulky, they were unusable. The photographs were in haphazard way. So they weren't even located next to, you know, they would have current photos next to photos that were taken probably in the 1930s. So they needed to come out of the albums and uh, we were able to sort them. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute, but you can see how this works. It's the same green table uh, where we were trying to sort them, but involve the other people in the group. And if, I, if you can find other family members that wanna help, this is a really good task for other people to do. So what I suggest after you've taken a good cursory look at all the photographs, Turn the darn things over and lay them on the table upside down. And you're going to find some fun facts. Not only are hopefully you'll get lucky enough that you'll be able to see that there's dates on them, but down here in the corner, a lot of the developers, when they develop the photos, they put a watermark of some, or some kind of mark on it so that they could keep the photographs together so that they wouldn't, you know, um, when you're developing for a, for somebody, you wouldn't get the pictures mixed up. So you'll see there's numbers or something in the corner of a lot of these kinds of photographs. Here's another one where you can see there's a four down here on the end. So if you can lay your photographs out and you're looking at the back of them, then it's possible you're gonna find that pictures match each other. At least they were all developed at the same time. And that may help you date the photographs better because you're gonna see that, um, you know, remember developing a, you know, when you went to take pictures back in the 50s and the 40s and the 60s, is we were, everything had to be printed. Nothing was digital. So they'd either make a slide or the negative, or they would print it on paper. So um, sometimes you would get your camera out and you take three or four photos and then you put the camera away and you wouldn't bring it back out for maybe six months to finish off that roll of film. So you can have huge disparities in time on the same roll of film, but they should generally be all kind of developed at the same time. When you put the pictures in a stack, if you were to take all the photographs and you put them in a stack, they should feel like a deck of cards where they fit together neatly. And if you look at the edges of these, pictures, you can see they're all developed at the same time. Some of them were even in like a little booklet and they would rip them out. Um, and sometimes you would receive it and it would be in a book. And you can see these all here have the same uh, developer mark on it. So that means these were all developed at the same time. Down here, this row, they're all crinkled in the same way. If you were to hold those in your hand, they would all feel the same. The, the crinkles would all match. So these bottom row are all on the same roll of film and this upper roll is on a different roll of film. And I think that's a good way of illustrating how you have to have the, you wanna look at the, the pictures in that way to, to, to get some organization. In the same way up here, these have a different kind of crinkle. These three are all the same roll of film. And down here, they have a different kind of crinkle on the edges. And you can see there's a, there's a number 698 that's stamped on here. So those all belong to the same um, roll of film. So that's one way of organize, organizing yourself, so getting yourself organized. So when I'm kind of done with my organization, I put them in these Ziploc bags again, and I put them in a giant Tupperware. And this is how it looks. And if I have um, envelopes, I mean, um, pieces of paper where I've written something on here, like this was taken at, you know, great grandma's um, retirement party, well, her retirement party, somebody's retirement party, and it was held in LA or, you know, some kind of information that I know from talking to someone, I put it in the envelope with everybody. Because remember, I'm not scanning at this point. I have, all I'm doing is just trying to organize. Here are a whole bunch of Ziploc bags that I've collected letters 
this is letters, check stubs, um, clippings from papers, and they've got them sorted by year. So this just gives me a way of, of getting it all together. And then I put them in plastic bins and I take these things and I put them in a place where I can find them and see them. I don't think it's a gr great idea to take your photographs and put them in a basement or a attic or a, uh, you know, an area, a shed or something like that. I think you've got to respect your photographs and, and keep an eye on them. Put them in a place where you can see them. You can add to this to it as you find more and um, you know where they are and you know that they're not having some little mouse or something eating at them or anything like that. So this is at the, at the point where I would stop if I were you um, and you still haven't, you know, you're done. A lot of you will be done. You've, you've done your task, which was to just get some organization to the box of pictures you found, um, write on a piece of paper and stick it with the picture saying, this is from a party that my family went to. And these people in the picture are probably all these people's names. And it was in Oregon, you know, whatever, you know, so you, so after you've collected all your photographs, you need to kind of come to a decision. Am I done? Because you could very well be done. Leave the, the task of scanning or putting the albums together um, to somebody else. It's okay. You don't have to finish off. You know, let somebody else did it. You've done an awful lot of work right there, just getting names on pictures and just getting them organized. Um, that's a task. That's a, that's a wonderful task to be done. So if you're there, don't be ashamed that you haven't finished beyond that because you, you're already ahead of like 90% of the people who um, try to do this task. So what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to change hats for a moment and I'm just going to talk about not scanning, but I'm going to talk about what you can do with photographs. And I, I'm not going to show you the technical part of photographs. I'm not going to show you how to do this because that's something that you can... Uh, would take hours for me to teach, but um, it's more of a trial by air, you know, something you're to learn on your own. But these are all pictures that I have taken from Ancestry. These were pictures that were uploaded and they're my family members, they're cousins that I don't have copies of any of these photographs. But this is an actual photograph of a cousin that somebody has uploaded to Ancestry and, um, you know, we can see the carpet, we can see the newspaper next to them, who knows what. Thankfully, they've uploaded something, but technology is changing so fast that what I want to show you is where we're at right now is how we're able to take something like this and turn it into something much nicer. So I'm going to show you just very quickly. I use something called cropping off of the computer. It's a free program that's probably on your computer right now. I'm not going to explain it, but it allows you to, to crop the image and take it and save it for yourself. And you can see this is a blurry image. Somebody's put a sticker on the photograph. Oh my gosh, my heart just goes out to somebody who would think that's a good idea. And it's blurry and it's not well restored. So this photograph is definitely in need of some restoration. So I spent a little time on it using some of the programs that are already on my computer. And I was able to kind of clean it up a little bit. I took the sticker off of it. And then using some other programs, I was able to restore it in a lot in a in a much better way and in time we're going to have better software that is going to be even easier to use than what i did that's going to make it even more attractive looking so you can see from the left to the right how different that photograph is and it brings the picture more you feel like you can you can see the picture better. You see more detail. You you have more of a relationship to that picture. There's that picture has a lot more respect right now. Here's another photograph I took off of Ancestry. This is a cousin, um, and you can see what they uploaded a photo uh, to Ancestry was this yellowed picture with scratches. It looks like it was in a photo album, and somebody drew on it with a pen. But I was able to with some practice. Uh, make the picture on the right and I change it back into black and white. I was able to um, restore it. You can see the tassel. You can see the hairs on the tassel, that kind of thing. So there's hope out there for a lot of these photographs that, that are just sitting in a box somewhere. So 
If you personally don't want to uh, restore these photographs, there may be somebody in your family that will do this for you, or you can pay somebody to have their services out there who will restore these photographs for you. So it, there's a lot of hope out there for these photographs. This one right here is a, a family grouping of a father with his daughters, the, the daughter, all of his daughters. And I found this on Ancestry with all these lines through it. And it's probably from a scanner. I don't, I don't really know, or maybe something in developing. But you know, it's a beautiful photograph of a loving you know, father with his daughters and their relationship to each other. But I wouldn't want to put that in a frame, uh, you know, but I spent some time on it and here's what I was able to come up with. And it's better. And probably if I spent more time, I could make it even better than that. But you can see the difference between these two. This is what was on Ancestry. And this is with about half an hour of work trying to get it cleaned up. So I am going to show you something else that I think is fun. This photograph here that you're looking at is probably three inches by two inches. My aunt gave it to me. It's a family photo of the whole family together, apparently. And she had a handwritten note. She had listed all the people on the back of who the different people are. Of course, now remember, she's writing this in cursive, which is one of those things that nobody's going to be able to read in about 20 years. <laughs> So I thought I better try to figure out a way of making this so that it is usable for other people. And I blew the, I scanned the three inch photograph. I blew it up, it is grainy. And I restored the photograph a little bit, taking out a lot of the spots and, and make it a little bit better so it's more readable. But once I took and I was able to look at it, I was not sure who was who. So, in, so I made a copy of it. And what I did is I added numbers to all the different people. And then I made a key so I could list all the people on it. And you could look and you can you can go back and say, oh, number 23 is so and so. And that is that little girl back there in the window. And that was just kind of my my little tip I wanted to show you. I'm going to show you one more photograph. And this is another photograph I took off of Ancestry and um, a cousin and it looks like some light got into it whenever it was taken. And it's pretty typical of a normal photograph you would find on, on Ancestry or in your box of photographs. And what I was able to do using some technology that exists now is I was able to colorize it and I was also able to clean up some of the spots. Now, I didn't spend a lot of time on this because I wanted to, um, Technology is improving so quickly that um, I could probably do this again another day. It's a family member, but it's not somebody I know really well. But you can see the arms are the wrong color, the hands are the wrong color. But um, I want to show you that technology is improving and we're going to be able to do this in a much better way. But I thought it was kind of a fun thing to show you, a visual. So now we're going to go to the last part of my talk and I'm going to talk about scanning. Now you don't have to be, the decision you've made at the very beginning about what your task is, maybe you're not going to be scanning. Um, or maybe you already have a lot of things um, restored and ready to go and you're ready to start the task of scanning. So I'm just going to talk about that briefly. These are the tools I've used and I've bought a lot of things over the years and I've wasted a lot of money. And uh, so I'm going to give you my knowledge of what I think is a good idea. Um, I have uh, uh, use a flatbed scanner. These are, and there's tons of different brands out there. And I don't think one's better than another. I think that you get what you find on sale and that you find is comfortable. This is a Canon printer that will print as well as scan. You want something that has a lid that will lift off. So on this, the lid will lift up and you could put a book down there or you could put something that's bulky, um, a picture frame or not a picture frame, but like maybe a piece of art that is you know, bulky you could put it on that scanner and you could scan it. So these are these are $80 or less. I think I buy this scanner, I think I paid 40 bucks for it. In fact, um, it's almost at a point that if you need more ink, you could just go buy a new printer and it comes with ink and it would probably be cheaper that way. The two terms I wanna make sure I explain to you are this DPI that you hear so much about in the scrapbooking world. A typical scan, is 300 DPI. DPI stands for dots per inch. And when we're talking about a computer screen, it's pixels per inch. So the higher the number of the DPI, 
then the more detail you're going to get on the scan. Also, it's going to take up more room on your computer or your hard drive, but it's also going to um, take longer to scan. Now, you could get 800 DPI, you can get 1200 DPI, you can get into these high numbers. But for a typical person who is just trying to scan their family history, they're probably never going to put this on a billboard somewhere. Um, you're maybe going to go to a five by seven picture if you printed it out. 300 is typically a good size. Because remember, sharing photos on a computer screen, if you're trying to make a website or something like that, if you have too high of a, a DPI, like 800 DPI or 1200 DPI, it's going to take a long time for the photograph to load on a lot of computers. And people aren't going to want to look at your photographs if they have to wait a minute for their photographs for the website to load. So for typical computer quality, 300 is just fine. So don't fall into this fallacy that everything has to be scanned at 1200 DPI. That's just, it's, it's just not um, realistic. Um, if you have a fine photograph that's in beautiful shape, well, maybe scan it at 800 DPI or something like that. But um, I mean, we're not, we're not preserving Rembrandt's you know, or Van Gogh's uh, um, writings that you found somewhere. Typically, the photographs that we're going to be, you're going to be scanning are things that were snapshots or not in great shape anyway. And keep in mind, the item you're scanning, you're not throwing it away when you're done. It's going to go somewhere in storage and you're going to keep it someplace so that if technology improves to where we can scan it 1200 DPI in seconds, well, then do it. But right now, it's not a big deal. This is the only thing I would spend any money on. This is a scanner that I absolutely adore. It's an Epson Fast Photo. And they've come out with different, this one's at FF680. Um, and there's probably other versions of it as well. It's about $500. I love this. I keep this on my desk. Uh, it scans in a second and it scans front and back. It is quick. You can change the DPI to 1200 or 800 or 600 and it still scans it but this is the kind you have to send the, the picture through so it's not like um you could you could um put something thick through this this is just like you can put a stack of photos like it has in the illustration there and you would be done in seconds so when people send me postcards or i need to scan something for uh you know you have to scan it sign it send it back to to whoever it is. This is a wonderful workhorse kind of scanner. So this is the only thing I would spend any money on. And then I want to mention just briefly negatives. Negatives, of course, you're going to have lots of negatives, slides, um, sitting in drawers. At this moment, I think that until you are a little more advanced at what you're trying to do, that you should keep your negatives in a nice dry container in the original packages they gave you and store them where you can see them for their, you know, where they are, not where little mices and um, come and visit them. But negatives, if you, if you get a scanner that scans negatives, it can be a real expense and it's very time consuming. There are some technology where you can scan them with your, your phone that does a pretty good job. You could also take your negatives still down to a, you know, one of those stores that still develops film and you could probably get them turned into photographs and then scan the photograph. But my advice to you is this is kind of advanced and uh, unless all you have is a negative, I would just set it aside and, and um, when you're ready to tackle negatives, you'll know you're ready to tackle negatives because it's kind of advanced. So as I wind up on this, I just want to talk about just really quick about preserving your history and that remember that you are part of your history and you never know what it is that's going to be important to generations that are coming behind you. Handwriting is one of those things that changes in generations as we see. And these are some just different uh, pieces of handwriting that my mom had and my dad had just saved. 
And this has a lot to do with their personality as I see them making lists. I do the same thing and my children did the same thing. And I can see this feeling that we all, you know, we're all this one generation of what we're like. So I saved, you know, I don't know if I'm going to save all these pieces of paper I found, but I sure as heck I'm going to scan them so that I can, I can preserve them. This is a math book that my aunt found in Arkansas in the back of a drawer and it was really falling apart and she preserved it. She mailed it to me. And um, as I scanned it on a flatbed scanner, remember, this is not going to go in that uh, fancy $500 scanner because that's going to be bending it as it goes. I was able to lay this out and um, I scanned my mom's math book. So this is from the 1930s, 1929, I think it says at the top. And um, it was wonderful to see my mom's math book, just seeing her do math. And there's nothing fancy about it. It's just my mom's math book. It's not going to go into the Smithsonian or anything like that. Other things that I collected were other notes that they'd made. Here's a drawing somebody made. And I don't know if anybody recognizes the object on the left. That's kind of, I've enlarged it a little bit, but it was, our, it was a little piece of paper that fit on the, the phone, you know, the rotary phone that we had with our phone number on it. I thought that was kind of fun with, with our old area code. Um, I found recipes. I found scrapbook, um, not scrapbook, clippings that my parents had clipped out. I think they're always kind of fun to see what my mom and my father would have collected. This is a, an article about shortening. You put shortening on your face and it'll clean your face better. Uh, Joey Bishop, the last of the Rat Pack dies. I think those are all kind of fun to know what my parents thought were interesting enough to keep. Um, also, we probably all have buckets of uh, paper from our kids that, and then grandkids and cousins and stuff like that of artwork they created over the years. And you don't want to get rid of it, but come on, you've got to get you've got to get rid of some of this paper. So maybe scanning it is a better option than um, trying to keep every single piece of paper that your child had, had drawn. And this is something I drew in second grade. This is what something my mom kept. I'm so glad. It says, I want to be an archaeologist and I want to find bones of dinosaur, dinosaur. And I love it because I am kind of an archaeologist of sorts still now. I kept, uh, I scanned every uh, calendar I could find and I scanned every address book I could find. I don't need to go in to do research on it. I just have them. And if I need them, well, heck, it may solve some mysteries, especially in genealogy in the future. But I have every one of them scanned. Um, my dad was given one of those books like, you know, hey, grandpa, what was it like to be a, grandpa, a little boy? And he filled out about three pages in this big old book. And I thought, well, am I going to have to hold on to this big old book for the rest of my life because it has three pages in it that my dad filled out? And I had to make that decision. I said, no, I will just get rid of the book, but I will scan the pages. And so I have it. And they're wonderful. Those three pages he filled out, you know, it tells me all kinds of stuff about who was his, who did he listen to on the radio and who was his favorite actor and, and what was it like growing up and how much did it cost for a gallon of gas back when he was growing up? I love this stuff, but really I, it's gotta be, you gotta downsize at a certain point. We can't, guilt our family into hanging on to everything that we've ever collected and just because grandpa you know had it for a while this i had to keep this is back in the days when computers were just starting out my brother made a computer for my dad and he had to write out all the instructions on how to do things on the computer and i think this is hilarious but it shows how far we've gone and it's a piece of history and it's written in my dad's handwriting and i love it and i've got pages and pages and pages of this kind of stuff when you get a letter, when you find a letter, I suggest scanning it, but using a dark color of behind it. Again, this is probably best if you scan it on a flatbed scanner, but also scan the envelope. Not only does it have a lot of personality to it and preserves your history, but it gives you addresses, it gives you dates, um, and it should all be kept together. So you should always kept, keep everything together if you can. So you've got your, your um, it shows your handwriting and it also can give you clues in, if you're doing genealogy, sometimes there's clues within there. They would say something like, oh, did you hear that uncle Joe died and he's, you know, 
they're burying him next week at such and such cemetery. And it may give you clues to where you can find other documents for this history that you're trying to preserve. So, um, oh, one of the tasks I have for myself that I haven't started yet is, as I keep alluding to, um, cursive writing is going to be a thing of the past. And we're preserving our history not for you today. This is being preserved for the generations that are going to come after you. And they're going to have a really hard time reading cursive writing, and they may just get frustrated and not even bother with it. So one of the things I'm planning on doing is pulling up each of these letters and doing a transcription of it, typing it out on a piece of paper that will be kept with these um, letters so that not only can I read the letter and enjoy it for just for it being a letter, but also because future generations won't have to go to that trouble to do it. So that's something I'm planning on doing. So I think that it's really important that we hit record in our lives. It is very important that we preserve not only the history that our family left us, the, the, um, the uh, documents that you've been handed, the the photo albums you found, the box of scrapbook pictures you've got in the bottom of your closet somewhere. That isn't the only thing that we should be preserving. We should be preserving you and the people around you that are here today, not only the oldest people in our group, but everyone. Preserve these memories because they will become important and precious someday. The, the items that I've collected of my mom, not only the bonding experience I had with my mother was just, I mean, more important than going on a vacation to Hawaii for a month. It was so important to me um, seeing her and understanding her history and her family's struggles. And it helped give me insight into how great I've got it. But record your history and we're all carrying around these cell phones. They all have plenty of capability of taking lots of photographs, um, hitting record and recording people's voices and shooting videos. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be professional. I'm telling you, don't wait until the perfect moment. Just do it today. We're all on Zoom right now the, you know, over this time. And Zoom gives you 45 minutes free for everybody. Just hit the darn record button and call up somebody and say, hey, remember that time we did this? Will you, you know, I want to record that story and record it. My sister at one point, I remember back in 1989, after the Loma Prieta earthquake made each of us write down where we were and what we were doing when the earthquake happened. And I rolled my eyes at the time and I thought, this is so hokey. Of course, I'll never forget where I was during this very important time. But now I look back on it and I can see my mom had written all these um, stories about where she was with one of my children and what she was thinking. And then those are precious now. So possibly maybe even recording a session with family members that are in friends around you and say, hey, what was the pandemic like for you? What was lockdown like for you? And record it and tell stories and laugh and and they're they're wonderful. So I'm going to play 15 seconds of, or so on two videos. This is my mother. I recorded this right before she died in obviously. Um, this is her 85th birthday. We just come back from dinner and I hope I can figure out how to make this play. And I don't think I will. Oh, goodness gracious. Nope, it's not going to do it. But anyway, so this is a 15 set. Uh, this is a video I shot of my mom. Oh, here it goes. That takes a second. So I'm just going to play about 15, 20 seconds of it. Hopefully you can hear it. Can you guys give me a thumbs up if you can hear it when it starts for whatever reason? Yeah, tell me about can you hear it? kindergarten. Do you remember that? Okay. Yes, I remember uh, I was about seven years old when I went to kindergarten because... Why were you so old? Uh, because our home had burned and the only shoes I had burned with them and I uh, had no shoes to wear and no money to buy shoes for me to wear to go to school. So that was one thing I created just before um, she died. And then I moved her into my house 
And so I, I pulled out, you know, she didn't want to talk about a lot of other things, but she created a lot of quilts for us. And so I gave her a quilt and I said, mom, tell me the story of this quilt. So I'll play about 15 seconds of that. Go. Well, this is Tracy Kirby from Susan's House. And we're looking at the quilts that we made. And I'm looking at one that I made, uh, eight point star. And uh, this brown uh, material was one that I made from Susan's dress. And uh, let's see, I. Okay. Uh, let me end it. Maybe it'll let me end it. Maybe it won't. Okay. So that's where I conclude. Um, what I'm trying to say in that is, is don't wait until it's a perfect time for, for creating a video. Um, my father died in 1989, right before the Loma Prieta quake when everything was crazy. And I have no recordings of my father. I have no idea. I can't remember what he sounded like. I have, it's gone. So his particular way of speaking, his, all of that is gone. My brother had recorded my dad many times. He would read the cartoons and he would laugh as he's explaining him. And um, he would cry. He would laugh so hard. And it was so funny. And I thought my brother had hung on to those because they were really important. But my brother recorded over the VHS tapes. I just could kill him. But that's what he did because he didn't preserve it. And he always thought there'd be another time where he could he could do it later. And so now we have nothing. We have no, uh, um, his voice is gone. So I think it's important that we try to, um, try to record our family history, even if it just seems like it's kind of not important because later it will be important to somebody. And just listening to my mom's accent, the way she says things was just so great. So, so that is the conclusion of my talk today. And I have my email there for people who might want to um, get in touch with me and I'll be happy to answer further questions. Ta-da!